this video we're going to see how local variables can be used in SVA properties and one example of where they're useful. When we define a property we can define it with local variables that is variables declared locally inside of the property. What this provides to us is a dynamic unique copy which is created for each copy of the property being evaluated. So remember now we're not talking about different instances of a property we're talking about the same property instance but it could have multiple copies being evaluated at the same time due to overlapping that we discussed earlier. So each one of those overlapping copies that are being evaluated has its own value for its unique variable. And unless we pass that variable out via the parameters of a property then there is no way that that can be seen externally. There is also no way inside of the property of referring to any specific evaluation of the same property or indeed a different property. The way in which we use these local properties once we've declared them is by assigning values to them or changing their value should I say on an occurrence of a particular subsequence and the way in which we attach that subsequence to the actual assignments that we give to the local variables are by enclosing in parentheses the subsequence, then a comma, then we have a comma separated list of assertion variable assignments. Inside of the property these are treated as a normal variable. We can also have multiple statements as we've said by having a comma separated list. In this example what we've got here is a property called response and in it we declare one single local variable called int psych we can define as many local variables as we wish, in this case we only have one. So what we're saying is if we've seen a rows rec then what we're doing once we match that subsequence is we're assigning to the local variable cyc the value 1. What this then implies is that we have not ack occurring between 1 and 4 times and every time we match not ack which could be between 1 and 4 times we're incrementing the value of that assertion variable. On the cycle after that, what we're doing is requiring act to occur, and when it does, we're attaching to it this statement. So when we have these comma-separated statements which follow a match of a subsequence, they don't necessarily have to be related to the assertion variables. They can do anything you like, and one useful thing you can do is a dollar display. So what we're doing is dollar displaying the value of CYC. So what that assertion will check for us is once we've had a rows of rec, then within five cycles we get an ACK, but we don't know if we look at the pass-fail indication of the assertion whether that was one, two, or three, or four cycles we were waiting for ACK to occur, but using the local assertion variable to count how many cycles we were waiting and then putting that in a dollar display gives us that information. So we'll see a more realistic example in a moment. The previous slide showed an example of how we could use assertion variables this one, however, is more practical and more realistic. As we said before, there is no limit on the number of assertion variables we can have. So in this example, we've got two. We could have had three or more if we needed them. The property myprop has an integer called i and a 8-bit logic signal called myvec. And what we're doing is, on the left-hand side of the implication operator, if start occurs, then what we do is make an assignment to that local variable i of the value 7. And on the next cycle, what we're expecting to see is serial data in valid eight times consecutively. And to every one of those eight occurrences of serial D in valid, we're going to assign to a index of myvec, and that index is pointed to by the current value of i, which is the local variable. We're going to assign to myvec i the value of a signal serial D in. Okay, and we can see the waveforms down the bottom here. Now, we've got another statement after that one. We decrement i. So after we've used i, we then go and decrement it. Following the eight occurrences of serial d invalid, we then go and give a Boolean expression which says myvec equals expected val. Expected val was this local parameter we defined here as a constant. So its value in hex is 8e. If we were to follow this through then, so when start occurs on the diagram, it only occurs for one of those cycles of pos edge clock. On the next cycle, we are going to expect to see serial D invalid for eight cycles, and if we count them, so the numbers here are seven down through zero. 
So that's eight cycles. On each one of those eight cycles, what we're doing is assigning to my VEC I, serial D in, and decrementing I afterwards. So on the first iteration here, on, on seven, the value of I is seven. That came from the assignment. And that assignment came from when start occurred as the enabling condition of this assertion. So I has seven, so we assign to my VEC seven serial D in. On cycle indicator six, we're assigning to index six the value of serial data in. And on the cycle indicators five, we're assigning to my VEC five the value of serial data in, and so on, until we reach the cycle that's indicated as zero here. On the cycle following that, because we have a hash hash one in the property fulfilling sequence here, we're checking that my VEC equals whatever the local parameter expected value is set to, and indeed it does. So what we can do, or what we can do here, as you've seen, is we can perform checks on serial data in an assertion in a very kind of convenient way. We've captured everything we needed inside of one assertion. We didn't need any external code with it. So you've seen now how to use assertion variables in one practical example. However, I would caution you, um, don't go crazy with these assertion variables. They can lead to very inefficient descriptions, especially for formal verification. So the question you should really ask yourself when using an assertion variable is, is there no other way of doing it? And other way of doing it doesn't necessarily just mean normal SVA code. I would strongly advise you, especially if you're using formal, to go and research what auxiliary code or assertion helper code is. So if you go to the Cadence support site, support.cadence.com, do a search for formal verification optimization webinar. This is mostly about how to make very efficient SVA and auxiliary code, that's HDL helper code descriptions, in order to evaluate expressions much more efficiently. Another disadvantage of using local variables is they can be very hard to debug. If you can imagine you have a lot of overlapping assertions, each copy will have their own value for the local variable, which they cannot share with each other. There's no way of passing a local variable from one thread to another thread of the same property. So all in all, um, I'd recommend that you don't use them, except if you come across a situation where there seems no other alternative, and it'll be fairly obvious to you when you've reached that kind of situation. That concludes this short description of a local association variables. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.